Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to St. Dominic's, uh, our uh, parishioners, uh, friends of the community, uh, members uh, and patrons of the Benedict uh, Institute. Uh, welcome uh, this evening uh, to just a really extraordinary moment, uh, talk and interview uh, with um, Sir James McMillan. I had been uh, announcing and telling folks uh, of some of his um, real wonderful accomplishments and uh, kind of legacy, so to speak, and I referred to him as the Steph Curry of sacred music. And someone said, does he even know who Steph Curry is? It's okay if you don't. He's a, he's a basketball player, a local basketball of some import, but people were excited. <laughs> so, so warm welcome to you. Um, certainly, uh, it goes without saying, uh, his accomplishments, his contribution uh, to uh, sacred music, uh, composing, uh, conducting, uh, and as I often say, I, I'm not going to list all of those things because at the uh, risk of leaving something out or underrating something, but rather I'd just like to begin in, by way of introduction by just telling a, a personal story. And this is the story. As a uh, priest, you learn how to both preside and to engage in uh, the seasons the church presents uh, for us. Uh, and of course, the first liturgical season we enter into is the Advent season, that time of expectation for the coming of the Lord. And it often has in those first three weeks a sense of expectation for the Lord's return in glory. And then on the 17th of December, it takes a turn towards the historical present coming of the Lord Jesus into our hearts, especially connected with a great feast of Christmas. And I think most of us know uh, the hymn, classical hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and myself growing up, that was the hymn of Advent. Come, O come, Emmanuel. Everyone knows it. You sing it almost to the point of exhaustion if you start out at the beginning of, of Advent with it. And so, uh, coming pastor here, uh, be, um, hearing different music over the years, I can tell you that when I came, that very first year, we had a uh, recital or a, um, an evening of, of music which featured these, those old antiphons, right? Those seven images of our Lord in the Old Testament that uh, give a musical cadence to the expectation that we have. And as I was there, I, was, I did the bidding prayer and was kind of presided over uh, this evening event that we have every year. The particular selection that first year uh, was, uh, and it's particularly striking to me, was the O Orions on December 25th, the O Radiant Dawn. And if you haven't heard it, if you've been here and heard it, you know. And for those who don't, I would certainly recommend finding it anywhere uh, where you find music on the internet. Uh, but hearing for the very first time the composition arranged uh, by Sir James, the Radiant Dawn, and the sixfold Veni, come, 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 come and shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death. And I remember exactly where I was sitting. And for me, that has become the soundtrack, the antiphon for Advent. <laughs> when I hear that music, I think the Lord is on his way. Let's get ready. <laughs> and I went to Simon that evening. I said, I said, who put that little ditty together? You know, I'm very professional when it comes to music. <laughs> I said, that guy's got it. <laughs> anyway, so, so a very warm welcome. I know we, we just had a chance to just meet very briefly, but know that uh, particularly that piece of music and all that you've given to the church has helped us here in St. Dominic's, has helped the broader church. Couldn't be more delighted to have you here and to speak about these issues, these things that are so close to your heart. Without further, a welcome to James McMillan. Thank you. It's my job as music director here to interview Sir James, or should I call you? James will do. James will do, not Jimmy. Eventually. Jim, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I discovered tonight the best way of getting a great group of people to listen to an organ postlude is to invite him here and you all stay, because normally the people flock out the doors here. Where were you born? 
I was born in Ayrshire, uh, back home in Scotland. Uh, it's not too far from Glasgow, the, the biggest city in Scotland. How far is that from Glasgow, would you say? Um, it's, it's about an hour's drive, an so hour's it's drive, quite yes. close. And 1959, that's a particularly good year, we hear. Yeah. So you were born in 1959, too, I take it. Yeah. <laughs> um, music at primary school. Uh, yes, yes, like many British school children of that vintage, I was handed a little plastic recorder uh, by a teacher when I was about seven or eight, and uh, well, my life changed. I, I can't say that, uh, well, I don't think that um, being given a little plastic recorder is the seismic ev event it is for most British school children, but it was for me, it was like a light going on and it, it led to other things very quickly. My grandfather was a coal miner and um, the, the, um, the colliery bands are very strong in the British coal fields. Um, the, the, bra the, the brass band tradition uh, was, was uh, alive and well in industrial areas and he played the euphonium in colliery bands all through the 20s, 30s, 40s and he, he got me my first cornet and took me along to my first band practice. Uh, so I was a brass player for a little while as well, as well as dabbling in anything I want, anything I took, that took my fancy, the piano and, uh, and singing as well. Was it a Dolmetsch recorder? I think it probably was, yes. yes. We, we had them too. I was way down south at the same year with the same make of recorder and it set me on fire for music too. Mm. Were you singing in a church choir or in church at all? Uh, I, I started singing as a teenager, uh, and although it was a lot of sacred music that I was singing, it was actually with a secular choir, that, a school choir, high school choir, uh, that I was learning this, this music, which was quite odd, actually, because the, um, I, I was the, actually the only Catholic in the whole school, which for the west of Scotland was quite a brave thing uh, for, my, for me and my parents to, to do. But um, I was amazed to watch all my non-Catholic friends uh, through the, the, the involvement in the school choir, fall in love with Palestrina and William Byrd and Lassus and all this Catholic music. Uh, it seemed to make an impact. And f at some point then you started composing. What was the first composition? Well, I knew I wanted to be a composer from the first day I was given that little recorder. I didn't know what it would mean, um, didn't know what it would mean later on, um, but the desire to write music was uh, instant, and I started write, putting little sequences of notes down even before I had the, the power of um, notation. Um, but eventually, within a few weeks, when I, I, I got some kind of notational skills, uh, I wrote a little piano piece for my mum uh, in A minor, and I've still got the music for that. How wonderful. I was decomposing at that time. <laughs> um, you're married to Lynn. You have three children? Yeah. All adults yep. now? You're connected to Father Alan White from the English province of Dominicans. I believe it was he at your wedding? Yes. Um, I, I've been very close to the Dominicans ever since I was an, undergra an undergraduate at Edinburgh University. Uh, my first chaplain there was uh, Father Aidan Nichols, uh, who has written uh, copiously on, on lots of things, on liturgy and uh, theology and, uh, and history and culture, uh, and Father Allen was one of the, the young students at the time. So the, Dominic the English school, of, the English province of Dominicans were um, very instrumental in my formation at that stage, and uh, they brought my wife Lynn into the church, and uh, um, um, yeah. We, if the Dominicans married us and 40 years ago uh, this, this July, so, and I'm still very close to them, so they must have done something right. And you've been a third order Dominican up when you've managed to be in here by an active church? Yes, I, I was very much involved in the third order um, when I was younger, and I've maintained those very close links with the Dominican order ever since. I think we have all three orders of the Dominicans present tonight. There's some second orders, and there were some first orders over here, and there's some more third orders over there, so you're in great company. Um, you were knighted. Isn't that extraordinary? I wasn't. <laughs> I don't think they like me anymore because I, I moved away and stopped paying tax. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, you, knight, you don't look like a composer, but you do look, look like a knight. I think composers have round glasses and scruffy hair and unkempt clothing and can't really concentrate on the matter in hand because they've got this music. But you have everything. 
the looks, the, and the knighthood. Who, who knighted you? Tell us a little bit about that. Um, it was Prince William in 2015. And, well, it was as much as a surprise to me as anyone that, that, that they would want to uh, uh, give me an honour like that. But uh, I was very proud, and, and my father was still alive at the time, and um, he was very proud too. And he came along to the, uh, the ceremony, which was at Windsor Castle. And, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it, was a, it was a great moment, I think, for, for, for music as well. It's, it's not often that composers uh, are honoured in that way. Um, uh, uh, and, and I think it reflects on the wider musical culture that it's, that it's being celebrated and uh, um, respected in that way at, at that kind of level. So we're going to move on to some music now and think about sacred music, how that comes about. We've all sung tonight the St Anne Mass. It's a simple congregational mass that we've used in this parish at several masses over the last mm, seven years and we can reawaken it this season, so be ready for the St. Anne Mass. How did you come to write that? Well, I wrote it for children uh, back home in Ayrshire uh, in the 1980s. Um, the St. Anne is actually St. Anne's Primary School in Mossblown, near Ayr. Uh, so I, I wrote it for them, I taught them it, uh, became clear that uh, young youngsters were keen to sing, and if, if, if youngsters, if, if children can sing uh, melodies like that, uh, then their, their parents and grandparents could, could as well, and that's the way it's worked. It's become embedded in, in many parishes and dioceses back home in, in the UK, and I'm delighted to see that you're, you're using it here in San Francisco too. It's just a very simple melody. You probably noticed some of the the, the Scottish contours, especially in the Sanctus, uh, I, I'm very influenced by Scottish folk music sometimes, and I was playing in a, a Scottish folk band at the time, around about the pubs and the clubs in the west of Scotland, and I suppose the influence went into many of the, the, the work, m much of the work I was doing, including this little setting of the Sanctus, um, and it's, I'm delighted to see it. it's had a life ever since. Now, and that's one of your more simple pieces of music, and we appreciate it. The musicians here appreciate how well it's written. The young people who sing here really like your mass settings. They find them rhythmically interesting and uh, melodically interesting. They're not pablum by any means. They're, they're interesting miniatures of composition. So let's move on to some of the larger pieces. I've got two books here called Strathclyde Motets. A blue, you can see. The Strathclyde isn't really a word that in a name that inspires confidence in England, because the Clyde is a big industrial area, isn't it? Can... That's right. Um, uh, Clyde is the main river that flows through Glasgow and out into the Firth of Clyde. Strathclyde, uh, which is the the valley through which the Clyde flows, as it were, is an ancient uh, Scottish kingdom. It's actually pre-Scottish. It's a, it's a, a Pictish, um, um, Britonic um, kingdom that goes back a way, way back thousand, a thousand years at least. And uh, it's still used today in, in connection with some of the, uh, the area. Uh, and in fact, there's a University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. And, and these motets were written for their... Um, University Chamber Choir. I wanted to create a body of work which was of use to good student or good amateur choirs that, that could be used uh, in churches and, and, and by uh, secular choirs as well. And so I, I made 14 of these motets. The Strathclyde Chamber Choir came to the Dominican chaplaincy at the University of Strathclyde and, and sang these. Um, for mass on occasions. Um, uh, they are mostly settings of communion texts, in, mostly in Latin. Uh, so I think 12 out of the 14 were actually written for uh, the Strathclyde Chamber Choir. And then the other two uh, were written for my little group of volunteers, because although I'm not really a church musician, I don't really have the time anymore. But for 10 years, I, I did devote 
a lot of energy to working with a group of volunteers in one of the parishes in Glasgow. And these were people who didn't really read music. Many had never sung in choirs before, but they were desperate to be involved in the liturgy in some way. And, and that's a good sign for any church that people want to, people who are not necessarily specialists in music, will want to involve themselves in, in music. Because as, as we know, and has been uh, already expressed in the, tonight's homily, there's a deep umbilical link between music and the sacred, and that, um, that m music has a, 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 an important place in the liturgy. But when you can involve ordinary people, uh, amateurs, as well as the professionals in the divine praises of the church, um, that I think helps the liturgy. So Strath the Strathclyde motets were attempts to uh, provide a body of new work, mostly communion motets for the church. So if you go to YouTube, you can hear recordings of these Strathclyde motets, just dial that in. One of them is O Radiant Dawn in the center, but you can listen to these. The 16 have recorded them very nicely, and they're available on YouTube, so you can get an idea of what this music's about. If you open the first page and show it to singers, they'll usually back away slightly because it's eight parts of very complicated looking musical notation. Well, it's seven but it sounds like <laughs> hundreds. And there's very, good, there's very great rhythmic complexity and notes that don't look like they're very easy to find. But in fact, one of the geniuses, geniuses of his compositions is that they are actually not very hard to rehearse and perform once you've had the courage to take them apart and find out what's going on. How many of this set are based on Gregorian chant? Um. I think there's probably about 14 of them. So uh, the chant is very important. We heard that uh, at Mass today. Um, the chant is the very sound of Catholicism. I think you'd agree. Um, and in, in recent years, we've been advised by the likes of Benedict XVI to reflect on the deep heritage of the church, whether it's Gregorian chant or the polyphony uh, that, has, that, that made the liturgy so beautiful as potential models for music of our own age. And I took Benedict at his word, I suppose. I took him very seriously when he said these things. And I began to wonder how reflections on the chant and reworkings of the chant and uh, arrangements of the chant or taking the chant as a kind of form of musical DNA and uh, um, placing it at the heart of a new piece of music could work. And uh, there, as I say, I think there's the majority of these, maybe 12 out of the 14, are based on chants that are appropriate for uh, the, the communion of, of various masses throughout the liturgical calendar. And some of these aren't too hard to sing. They're sort of grade one star, and some of them are grade two or three stars. That's right. Uh, my publishers, Booz and Hawks, grade my music according to difficulty levels. So level one is very easy, and I think O Radiant Dawn comes in at that level. But there are others in there that push the level up a bit to level... I mean, the hardest level for my publishers is level five. I don't think there are any level five pieces in there, but there might be a level three. Now, I'm interested in this chant influence again, because it's, it's very deeply rooted in your music, um, like the music of Maurice Drufle, who's another of our champions, and Charles Tournemir. What, what is it about the chant that enables you to produce a composition? Let's ask a specific question. Where do you start with a new composition if you have a chant in mind? Well, I think I've lived with the chant ever since I was very young, and it's always struck me as, in many ways, the most perfect form of music. It's this endless melody uh, seems to come from heaven, or so I've always thought, even, even as a youngster. Uh, there's something extra special, extra or something out of this world about chant. It's, it's, the, it's the kind of music that seems to connect with the, the numinous in a very profound and, and easy way. And, and that's why it has been at the, the core of our church's musical tradition for not just hundreds of years, but right back into the, the first millennia. Uh, the chant began life uh, as the music of the church in the first millennia. 
it provided the basis for the development of music, um, not just for the church, but for the world uh, in the second millennia. And it's still with us today, uh, it, um, inspiring composers to react to it, uh, to um, um, bring it into the, their own music in some way. Um, Within the world of music, there is a, great, a deep respect for the chant. There's a knowledge that this um, beautiful music goes back into the, the, the deep depths of our civilization. And I know many people, many fellow composers who are not necessarily Christian or even Catholic, nevertheless have a great respect and love for the chant. My great mentor and friend, Peter Maxwell Davis, who didn't share my faith or worldview, had a copy of the Liber Usualis on his desk and looked at it every day, uh, delving into it, drawing from it uh, something he saw as the DNA of Western classical music. Um, it's there all through history, as I say, uh, and even he and people like him non-Catholic composers uh, saw the, the significance of this. So for me, a, a Catholic composer who, in a sense, instinctively knows where the, the chant lies in our culture, in our history, in our liturgy, um, it was a very natural thing to adhere to the contours of the chant and indeed the deep beauty and the, the meaning of the chant. We can prove this a little bit. I mean, if I sing something to you, I'm sure you will respond. Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus Dominus Deus Saba. You, you know how to do it. And if you're a, a 21st century Catholic, it's probably in your blood. If you were a, a mid 20th century Catholic, it may have been forgotten because they did go through a bad stage where chant was being ignored and replaced with other musics, not necessarily bad musics, but it was being gently eased out. Now it's being gently eased back and clothed and reclothed sometimes with your beautiful harmony and rhythms. Um, if you don't understand the depth of chant, if it isn't in you, I encourage you to try and find out. You could come to our chant workshops starting on the 8th of June for four Wednesdays and we promise you'll have a good time in the choir room learning about chant from the simplest possible formation. How do you choose the texts? For, for these? The, for any the, music you're going to compose. Well, um, that, that's a, a good question. For, for, for liturgy, it, the, the text is, is provided anyway. It's, it's, the, the task at hand is to take a particular text, in the case of the Strathclyde Motets, the communion texts, uh, and to set them uh, to music. That was, the, that was the task there. But you know, I, I write a lot, as I said, I write a lot for the secular world as well. Um, there's a, a debate about what actually is sacred music. Is it just for the liturgy, or is there a place for sacred music out there in the world? Um, I, I tend to take both views. Uh, both, I, I advocate for sacred music in the liturgy, uh, that it's still important, uh, as you hear me saying, but also uh, a lot of the music I write for the the concert hall, um, and in fact, one of the reasons I'm over here just now is that I'm heading down to Los Angeles next month to hear a brand new piece, um, a setting of a poem by Dana Joya, who some of you will know uh, of, of this part of the world, um, and that's, uh, that, that is a new piece for the Pacific Symphony Orchestra and Chorale called Fiat Lux, Let There Be Light, um, which is uh, lit liturgically based scripturally based, I suppose, but is a brand new poem by one of the United States' great poets. And, and so sometimes I, I sort of um, drift into the direction of the living poet. I, I, I love the fact that I can set the words of poets are still alive. And, and, and with Dana, uh, we talked about it. I came over four or five years ago to talk with them about the idea of this piece. Um, uh, and so that in, is a case in point where um, I not only chose the text, but entered into a dialogue with the, uh, the man who wrote the text, the poet. And I've done that on many occasions. I have a, a, a working relationship with a, a wonderful English poet called Michael Simmons Roberts. And uh, he's written many of my libretti for operas and for uh, cantatas and um, songs. Um, and working with a living poet is great. But 
you know, there is a wealth of um, tradition there as well, and I sometimes find myself delving back into the great poets of the past. Uh, I, I wrote a Christmas oratorio a few years ago, and uh, I, I varied the text. Some of the texts are, are Latin liturgical um, um, sources. Some of them are scriptural uh, passages uh, from the, the nativity narr- for the nativity narrative. But some are po- poems by the likes of John Milton and John Donne and Robert Southall, the great uh, Jesuit martyr. Um, so I have a, a, a deep love of text, and I have a v- various different ways of going about finding them. So if you were given a new text, say... Um the Lord will bestow his loving kindness and, excuse me, our land will yield its fruit. It's one of the texts you've set. Mm -hmm. How long will you sit with that text before you start penning notes? A a long while. Uh, I think it's important for the composer to get underneath the meaning of the, the immediate meaning of the text. Uh, and obviously, I, I think I set that one in, in Latin. But nevertheless, it was important for me to fully understand the meaning, the significance of the text. You have to live with it. I think you have to pray the text before you even get going with the actual music that you clothe the text in. The fact that there is a, a there are plain song settings of that, plain song um, origins of that particular text and many of the other texts in the book um, gives me a head start, I suppose. It uh, allows me to adhere to the music that already exists and, as I've said earlier, to try to draw some of the essence of uh, the the beauty of uh, Gregorian chant into the brand new music that's being made um, for the purpose of setting the text. When you go to see Dana next week, will you give him this book? It's called The Dominican Spirit and it's by... Show it to him. It's by Kevin Starr. Kevin's buried here, and his wife is just down there. Mm. And it's a great um, fret shift about St. the Dominican spirit of our friars. And we hope that you would enjoy that, reading that as well. Okay. There might be something in there for you to set. Who yes. knows? Thank you very much. Thank you. So you start with text, and you sit with it. And if it's chant-based, you probably have some ideas given from the chant. But if it isn't chant-based... Where does the first note come from, or the first chord, first sound? Well, ev- every situation is different. No, no day is the same for me uh, in my composing life. Um, I, I wake up in the hope that I'm, I'm still fertile in that sense, still what's, the ideas will still come. Um, so I've no idea really initially how the inspiration is going to be. But with text, uh, I try to live with it for as long as I can, um, to feel the the essence of it, the the meaning of it subliminally. There is is immediate meaning in a lot of these texts and poems, but there is a deeper meaning uh, and message in them too. And sometimes the music has to go between the words and underneath the words uh, into the deep hinterland of what these words are about. Uh, and that's a, a, a spiritual journey. Um, many will say that music is, a, is the most spiritual of the arts. Um, my poet friends disagree. They say poetry is the most spiritual of the arts. We have a friendly disagreement. But when they can come together, uh, it can be a truly numinous journey uh, into the search for the sacred. And I think, um, uh, as I say, not m- many of the texts I set, modern and ancient, are sacred. Some, some are not, some are secular, um, but it involves a deep journey into a hidden place, uh, the meaning and essence and power uh, that are not immediately uh, visible and uh, palpable in the words themselves, something that lies very, very deep. And that's the deep mystery of poetry. Uh, that's why I'm drawn to poetry and po- the, the men and women who make it, uh, because I think that music can be a, 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 either a handmaid or even a midwife to um, the, the deeper essences that need to rise up uh, from artistic expressions like these. Does prayer come into your search for a beginning or for development in the music? Well, very much so. I have my prayer life, and uh, I think that every composer, whether he or she is a believer or not, needs some kind of sustenance to the interior life. Um, 
Uh, I've spoken with many who share and some who don't share uh, my worldview, and they certainly recognize that necessity for a, a, sometimes a silent space, a, a, a paradoxically empty space, where there is not absence but presence. Um, and, and in prayer, uh, and in our culture, uh, religious culture, we know what we encounter in prayer. Um, we go seeking for something, uh, and sometimes we meet that something coming back at us. Uh, and, and that is the great essence of the spiritual journey, and I think it is the essence of the, um, the catalyst that can make music and poetry so alive. I pray be before I play the organ, sometimes they're heard. How about the mechanical process? Do you sit at a piano or keyboard? Uh, well, I have a piano in my study, but sometimes um, a piano can be more of a hindrance than a help to a composer. Um, and when I speak to the younger composers uh, that, that I work with sometimes and mentor, they have all these technological aids as well. Um, they can he hear uh, computer-generated versions of their music almost immediately. And um, they, 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 these are wonderful developments, uh, but they can get in the way. And I, I sometimes advise them not to rely on these uh, technologies, or indeed the piano, because you know, if I'm, if I'm wanting to write a piece of choral music, like some of the works you've been talking about, Simon, the last thing I want in, in my mind's ear is the sound of a piano. It's just not the sound I want to create, um, set, setting the, the words. I want to imagine uh, that choral sound or that orchestral sound or that instrumental sound um, in my own brain, in my own soul. And the piano is marvelous for checking that you've got some chords right and so on, uh, but one shouldn't rely on it too much, and I think it is important, it certainly is important for me to work as much as possible away from uh, a, t a technological aid like that, away from the sound source, uh, and that means exp allowing one's own inner ear to explore the possibilities in silence. Silence is a, has a kind of umbilical link with music. It's in the deep silences of our heart, deep silences of our soul, that composers find music. And uh, as I say, piano can help sometimes, but not always. Now, you use paper manuscript. You write with pencil. Yes, as I say, the technological advances of the last 30 or 40 years have passed me by. Um, I'm a bit of a technophobe in that sense. So I, I, I'm old school in that sense. I, I use pencils, paper, rulers, tipex. Uh, well, that's uh, white out for the Americans, oh, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. And, and a razor, a rubber to the English. Yes, absolutely, yes. yes. And yes. Um, uh, the, my only con concession to modern technology is that I have a, uh, an electronic pencil sharpener. An electronic pencil sharpener. Wow, that's, that's quite something. I've never seen one of those. Um, you were asked in was it 2011 by Westminster Abbey to write a special piece of music for Queen Elizabeth's funeral. Mm -hmm. Would you like to talk a little bit mm. about that? Yes, as you say, 2011 uh, was when I was asked to write it. Uh, you, you're probably aware that preparations for these events uh, um, happen years in advance. But I was invited in to, for a rather clandestine meeting at Westminster Abbey uh, with the director of music and asked if I would write uh, a, 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 a new anthem or motet for uh, Queen Elizabeth's funeral. No one knew, of course, when that would be. Um, but I was told that uh, the text that I set uh, from uh, uh, St. Paul's letter to the Romans, who shall separate us from the, the, the love of Christ, was one of her most famous, uh, one, is one of her most favorite and um, vital pieces of scripture that she dwelt on a lot. Uh, so I think the request did come from her that that would be the, the, the text that would be set. Um, I was told to keep it very quiet, to keep the, this idea very quiet, but, and also told that even although 
after writing the piece that things could change. Um, new members of the royal family could come forward, the different clergy could come forward, the ideas about the liturgy could change, uh, and therefore the, the, the piece could, might not be used. And I, was, um, I wasn't really sure whether it would be used up until uh, just a few days before, the, the, um, before they confirmed what the liturgy was to be. Um, I did tell my wife about it, I told my children, but I was quite confident that they wouldn't tell anyone because I usually told my children, anything I told my children usually went in one ear and out the other. Um, so they would immediately forget, and even I forgot about it because between 2011 and 2022 is a long time. But basically I wrote the music quickly, delivered it to my publishers, Booz and Hawks, who made the materials, they gave it to the the music department of Westminster Abbey, and it went straight into a drawer, uh, probably for the next 11 years, and probably taken out um, after she died, uh, and for the rehearsals to begin. We, we most of us remember where we were when that announcement was made. I was in Spain, and it was it was still a shock. Um, but that's the piece of music for which you'll be best known by millions and millions of people worldwide. For classical um, aficionados, you're probably best known for Miserere and Seven Last Words. It, it depends who you are. If, if you're from a choral background, people tend to know Seven Last Words right. um, or, or the Miserere. If you're an orchestral player or go to orchestral concerts, it's works like The Confession of Isabel Gaudi and a percussion concerto called Veni Veni Emmanuel, which has been played around the world oh, 600 yes. times. That's the first piece I really knew from Evelyn Glennie. Uh, Evelyn Glenn is a Scottish percussionist, and uh, she is without the benefit of hearing. And you wrote, that must have been a very special mm. thing to do. Um, uh, most choral singers around here, will, well, in Europe, will know you for O Radiant Dawn, and I think that's had most, the most effect on congregations. Mm. That and a new song, which is a, a lovely short motet, very positive, that we sing at the beginning of each season. Um, what do you listen to? Well, I'm ashamed to say this, but as I've got older, I find music um, has become more and more intrusive to me, and I try and I, I find it more difficult to listen to music. Uh, it's not I haven't given up listening to music. Uh, that would be insane, I suppose. But I, I tend to, to seek, out, as I say, seek out silence uh, in my working day. Um, so I basically won't choose to listen to something. I'll wait. It's usually first thing in the morning, listening to the classical music station in, in, in the UK, BBC Radio 3, and I'll just take whatever comes on, and I'll probably do the same late at night. But I, um, I find it difficult making choices about listening to music. Now, uh, I spend a lot of time preparing scores of other people's music, other composers' music, living and dead. And uh, I spend much more time looking at scores and possibly hearing that music through the eyes rather than the ears, uh, rather than making choices about music to listen to. I still live, obviously, in, in a world of music. I'm, I'm uh, submerged in music, but I'm also submerged in silence. And uh, as I say, there's a very close connection. What's on your desk at the moment? Uh, I'm writing a, a concerto for orchestra. I uh, brought it with me to the United States. I've, I've been doing a little bit of work on it, but uh, um, it's for the. Th there is a there is a, a, a an American orchestra involved. It's all you can't tell who commissions these p pieces, but there's um, there's a, there are a number of different orchestras involved. First performance next fall, I think. And we have a commission coming from you. We commissioned. Uh James, to write for this parish for our Jubilee, and it's due to be written or finished and performed next June. Um, when are you going to start on that? <laughs> very soon. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good. And we have, we have to discuss the text for that, yeah. and if there's a chant basis, we hope there's a chant basis, and we're thinking of Herbs Beata, um, which is a very beautiful chant hymn. Mm -hmm. An idea we have is that um, you can help further music in all churches, especially Catholic churches, in this part of the California, because um, next June we'll have this piece and we'll perform it, and we may have some workshops based on it and based on some of James's other music, especially the blue stuff. 
And we would like to invite him back to come and help us lead these workshops and show singers from San Francisco that the page of many, many notes that looks very hard is actually not too hard and fantastically beautiful in performance. So we're going to try and persuade you to do that. We'll talk to Lynn when she comes tomorrow, see if she can calendar it. We'll need some help with that. We'll need some sponsorship. <laughs> Silence, OK. I'll say we'll, we'll need some sponsorship. I've got a year to drum that up. But what a wonderful thing that would be to do to help the other church choirs of all types around here benefit from this extraordinary music. Um, so that's something about our commission. If you'd like to find out about our Jubilee music, there's some brochures down here. They're also on our website. Um, one of the points is to try and further the state of Catholic, especially church music around the world, but especially near where we are. That's one of the points of the Benedict XVI mm. Institute, mm. of which this talk is sponsored, partly sponsored. How, how can we do this? Do you have any ideas? Well, uh, last week I was over in Virginia uh, with the Catholic Sacred Music Project of the United States uh, where I was mentoring eight younger composers who were writing specifically new motets for Catholic liturgy. And uh, the, the Benedict XVI Institute were involved in that as well and uh, sponsored it. And um, it's quite clear that the Institute is committed to this kind of development for, for the liturgy, for music in the liturgy here in America. And uh, I think it's a, 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 it shows it mar not just a marvelous initiative, uh, but marvelous commitment uh, to the idea that music is important in the liturgy. And um, uh, so all power to you uh, uh, here uh, who are involved in that and who, who might be able to support the Benedict XVI Institute in their endeavors. Um, and the more it rolls out throughout the whole country, the better. Uh, the Catholic Sacred Music Project has addressed um, vari the various different parameters that are involved in liturgical music. They've run courses for choirs, they've run courses for conductors, they've run courses for church organists, and now they're running courses for composers. So hopefully advancing on all those fronts, we might see some development and evolution in what we've been talking about. Well, that's wonderful. We, we've done quite a few commissions here. Um, the one that's come this year um, is a mass setting and a motet based on Ubi Caritas, which you'll hear in July for the dedication of the church. It's very short. It's very, very beautiful, written by a Canadian. Here's another one. Um, local parishioner, composer Joseph Stilwell has written us a piece called Terra Tremuit, The Earth Shook. This is an Easter thing. I'll let you, that's a copy for you to have. It's slightly mirrored on one of yours, mm -hmm. but that's a great compliment, we hope, and nothing else. Um, and it involves trumpet and choir, and of course it has the chant. The interesting thing about these motets is that you probably wouldn't realize that they're imbued with the chant when you hear them. It's not obvious, but there's a background there which you will soak into you. Now, is there anything else you'd like to say before we go and find a pub or something for some dinner? Um, well, uh, just to say I, I'm delighted to, to be back here. This is my fourth visit to uh, San Francisco. I, I'm here for a long while, actually. I've, I've been in the States for a couple of weeks, all for different reasons. It's amazing how it's all connected. Having a little holiday for, uh, for a week or so from tomorrow, and then heading down to Los Angeles for this new piece, Fiat, Fiat Lux, um, which is my collaboration with Dana Joya. Um, I love coming here, and I've, uh, you have always made me very happy and um, uh, uh, at ease in this wonderful country of yours. How about some organ music as well next? Have you ever written anything for organ? I have. Oh, well, let's have an organ piece as well. <laughs> well, I'm terribly grateful that you've um, put up with my questioning um, and come to Mass and to Vespers are here for us. Thank you for furthering the cause of church music. Um, in the world, let alone around here, let alone in Glasgow. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, we're very, very grateful to you and inspired by you. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just, a, just a final word and a gift. Once again, thank you, uh, Sir James, for being here uh, this evening. A little token of gratitude and 
an aid uh, to prayer in recognition of what you've done certainly for the church worldwide, St. Dominic's, uh, and being here, and perhaps anticipation of being here again. Uh, just wanted to present to you um, uh, this uh, medal for, of St. Dominic in recognition of your work here, but also as um, perhaps an aid to prayer as you compose uh, the work that we've commissioned from you. Make St. Dominic a truly inspire you that the Lord might be present as we celebrate this anniversary and may you encounter him in that beautiful silence. 